All right, let's go to our Bible lesson for this hour. <clears throat> go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Hebrews, chapter 6. And I'm going to try to move along quickly for time's sake today. Let's read verses 7 through 12 right now as we continue. Hebrews 6, verses 7 through 12. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth uh, herbs, meat for those by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Uh, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We'll stop right there. <coughs> Excuse me. We looked at verses 1 through 6 last time, and I hope my exposition was clear enough. And the best way to understand those verses is going to be to apply them to someone in the future after the rapture takes place. During the tribulation, despite whatever some radio minister has ever said, um, salvation will not be by grace through faith plus nothing, trusting only in the work of Jesus Christ alone. Uh, but it will be some combination of faith and good works for those left behind uh, in order to keep it and to not lose it after the rapture takes place. And this is a doctrinal application of the general epistles, uh, the last nine books of the Bible, Hebrews, through the book of Revelation. And uh, we, we go to those books, we glean whatever we can uh, take out of them, for our, for our spiritual and our devotional benefit. But uh, literally, they will have to be aimed at someone else who's left behind after the saints have been caught up to heaven. And with that being said, let's continue. And we're not going to get past verse 8 today, but verse 7 begins, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh upon it, the scriptures at this point indicate a rain which will fall at the end of the tribulation preceding the second advent. Look forward at the book of James, just forward a couple of pages. James chapter 5, within these same um, general epistles, James 5, and notice there are verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And then he mentions Elias, or Elijah, down in verse 18. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. All of that is in the context just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Go back, if you will, to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. And I may bounce you around to a lot of verses and more quickly than I intended to, but I'm not going to apologize for it, just for time's sake this afternoon. Psalm 65. And uh, verses 1 and 2. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Wow. And that matches Isaiah 2, verse 3. Come ye, and let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And look at verses 9 and 10 there in Psalm 
65. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water, thou preparest them corn when thou hast provided for it, when thou hast so provided for it, thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly, thou settlest the furrows thereof, thou makest it soft with showers, thou blessest the springing thereof. Also Psalm 68, over a page or so, <clears throat> Psalm 68, and notice there verse 9, Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. And verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, uh, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Go also back to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel and chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, verse 1 says, These are the last words of King David, and he prophesies about his future son, who would be Messiah. And he says there in verse 4, And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. In the New Testament, <clears throat> run, if you will, to the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Revelation 11. <clears throat> Revelation 11, verse 3. God says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Verses 5 and 6, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters, to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Uh, go back to the book of Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, almost the last verse in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4, <coughs> excuse me, notice there verses 4 and 5. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments? Behold, I will send you Elijah, that's Elias in the New Testament, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Go forward just to the book of Matthew, chapter 17. Matthew 17, notice here uh, the first four verses. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, Elijah, talking with him, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. So not only did the Lord Jesus uh, predict the appearing and the return of Moses and Elijah before, he says, the great and coming day of the Lord, but here Jesus gives his disciples a glimpse of his second coming and his future glory and brightness, and with him on the scene are Moses and Elijah talking with him once again. And the, the, the text goes on, they were uh, fearful and fell to their faces. When they looked up again, the only one they saw was Jesus at that point. But, and without going into great detail, Peter's question, let us make your three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias, 
indicates the time of the year when Christ's glorious return will take place. The Feast of Tabernacles, which occurs around the month of September. It's interesting that even over history, uh, county fairs are held in September, where people are doing business in booths, temporary, temporary uh, shelters, as it were, uh, to transact business. And you see, none of that is by accident. God throws those little things out there for you to pinpoint when the second coming, the glorious uh, kingdom of Christ will commence and begin when he comes back. Not so with the rapture. That, that'll be a different subject. But um, go back, if you will, to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 17. And like I say, I'm going to try to move along quickly here. But 1 Kings 17. And um, well, verse 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's pretty cocky, really, unless he knew God was backing him up. Chapter 18. Chapter 18. And... Um, Now, verse 44, and it came to pass at the, seventh, at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Well, uh, Moses, that's going to be the one who causes water to be turned into blood, he's going to appear again, and Elijah is going to appear again before the coming of Jesus Christ in, glorious, in his glorious return, and they're going to do what they did the first time they were here. Moses will have power to turn water into blood, and Elijah will have power to, to declare no rainfall wherever he wants to. <clears throat> It might be worldwide, it may simply be wherever the Antichrist is enthroned, uh, in Jerusalem or what have you. But uh, the Bible's not specific about that. At least I can't find that it's specific. But uh, he'll be able to stop rain uh, by his own word. Look, look, one more time, just go forward back to the book of James, where we were just a few minutes ago. And here, when the general epistles up shows Elijah again, James 5, verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he, prayed, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. But uh, they're going to make another appearance. They're going to appear again in the world, do the things they did before, and uh, the Antichrist will be able to slay them and, and murder them. And then their bodies lie dead in the streets for three days while the world watches. And that'll be simple. Um, everybody will have live feed to see it worldwide like they do now. I remember... In, um, and I've, I've commented on the development of communications in the time of the American Civil War, it would be a couple of weeks later before news from the battlefront hit the newspapers. And then in World War I, it'd be a few days, they'd have news movie reels, uh, they'd show in movie theaters, that's about the only place, because they, they didn't have television yet, the only place you could watch motion, moving pictures was in the movie theater, and before the movie, they'd show you an update of what's happening on the battlefront. And similar, in World War II, they didn't have televisions in every home. Now, and then I remember coming forward to um, the Gulf War in the early 90s. And um, maybe a couple hours later, they would show you what had happened uh, in combat that time. 
And now they have reporters embedded with the troops giving you live feed of the action as it's taking place. And uh, I got to thinking, is this, if this thing continues developing as it is, it's going to be like, um, like American Idol, where people watching at home can phone in and tell the general what they think he ought to do next. Oh. <laughs> That's, that seems to be the way it's, it's progressed. But uh, live feed, that won't be a problem uh, to watch their dead bodies while they rejoice over these two guys that preached uh, hell, fire, and destruction and judgment upon the world, and we're happy to be rid of them. And after three days, their dead bodies come back together, and they stand up on their feet, and God takes them up to heaven. Uh, that'll be a real turn of events for everybody that was excited uh, over their deaths. But, and um, Now back in our text, Hebrews 6, verse 7 again, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. This will match what James, what James 5, verse 7 declares, when it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth. This is contrasted with our text, Hebrews 6, 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. So two things are being harvested, the good and the bad. Now this brings up something we've considered before, but maybe we haven't discussed uh, as fully as we could have, a limited discussion, which is what we call, refer to as a post-tribulation rapture. And in other words, it's right at the end of the tribulation before the glorious return of Christ. Um, if the plan of salvation after the rapture uh, is now a combination of faith and works, then we have to allow that some people will fulfill it and thus be spared God's wrath upon the world and on the Antichrist when Jesus returns. But um, look, if you will, forward at a page, a page to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, and start at verse 26. It says, For then must he, Christ, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, notice, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Go forward to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 and verses 14 and 15. Revelation 14 verses 14 and 15. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle of the earth, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. <laughs> All of this has been hiding in plain sight from a lot of the commentators who rely on Hebrew and Greek lexicons, or the opinions of the church fathers, or make an, an appeal to the original manuscripts, which have never been found. Yeah. There, are, there are no original manuscripts, so when someone says, uh, we believe the scriptures uh, are the verbally inspired word of God uh, as they're found in the original manuscripts, write that person off as being a, a, a fool, because there are no originals, no one's ever found them. All that have ever survived have been copies of copies of copies of copies. And so you have to, at some point, you're going to have to trust that God, if God wanted the words of God to be kept for, yeah. the, for the benefit of man, he would preserve their integrity uh, flawlessly, impeccably, from beginning to end, so that he could put a Bible in your hands that you didn't have to question, you didn't have to doubt, you didn't have to second guess, you didn't have to wonder, well, was that correct? Was this 
translated properly? Was that was that was there a mistake here or there? You could just take it and believe it from the get-go that what I'm about to read are the words of God exactly as He wants me to read them in the vocabulary He wants me to see and memorize, Amen. and uh, and I don't have to question it. In fact, I don't even think we it's our place to question the punctuation marks. Right. Leave that alone too. You weren't there doing the translating, and you weren't there when the scriptures were first given by the Word of God. So uh, who are you to start second-guessing the thing God put in your hands? Thank God for it and, and ask God to be your teacher as you go. That's about all you can do. And uh, But run back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. And I think we're still having some audio difficulties here. And I'll try to speak up. Matthew 13. I hear you good. And let's start there at verse, uh, now it picks up again, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And they answered and said unto them, He that soweth, is, uh, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the uh, tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of earth. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth um, as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, also go back, if you will, to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3 and uh, pick up there at verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, this is John the Baptist, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. That has an element of good works. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And on the heels of that, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mm. whose span is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. How in the world the Pentecostals could say the Holy Ghost and with fire had something to do with the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost is a real miracle indeed. They completely ignore the, the context before and after the verse. The fire... John preached, uh, John the Baptist preached, number one, the Holy Ghost. That's right now when you get saved. The baptism with fire will be on the unbeliever when Christ returns who weren't saved, who weren't trusting in Christ. Now, because if this is one thing that I've mentioned before, but most Christians forget about this. They forget this one little detail that can change the... the um, the uh, appearance or shed light on scriptures they otherwise stumble over. And this is the detail. Jesus' ministry, 
for three and a half years was technically still in Old Testament times. Before he died on the cross of Calvary, was buried and rose again. So what he taught, and his audience was primarily Israel, and they were still obligated to keep the commandments and offer sacrifices at the temple by the Levites. And so these things Jesus preached, his audience was primarily the nation of Israel, giving him the first chance to receive the Messiah. But so Christians often forget this, and they take verses like this that were aimed at to instruct the Jew about his response to God and his response to the Messiah or Christ, uh, or lack thereof, and what would happen to him if they, if they rejected him. And they often take that and they try to apply it to a Christian living in this day and age who is saved by grace through faith plus nothing on his part yeah. and try to say, you've got to do this, that, or the other in order to keep your salvation. Make sure you don't lose it. Like a Seventh-day Adventist wants to drag a Christian back under the Old Testament laws of the Sabbath day, and certain dietary rules and so forth, uh, or else you're in jeopardy of losing it. The Seventh-day Adventists, they went so far as to say that uh, worshiping from going from Saturday to Sunday as the, the common day Christians gathered together, that that was an act of the Catholic Church, and that was, the, the, effectively, that's taking the mark of the beast. If you start worshiping on Sunday and say that's the day Christians are are supposed to worship. There is no day you're supposed to worship on. Amen. You're supposed to love God every day. Amen. But uh, to say that that's the official day, you've effectively taken the mark of the beast, you've given your loyalty to something the Catholic Pope's taught, and that is not taking the mark of the beast. And uh, it wasn't. It didn't start with the Catholic Church, it started with the New Testament. Um, the day of Pentecost, Penta meaning five or fifty, fifty days after the Sabbath day, they were to they were to count uh, seven weeks after the Sabbath day, and then on the fiftieth day that would be the day of Pentecost. Well, if seven times seven uh, is forty nine days, then the next day would be the first day of the next week. So the day of Pentecost fell upon the first day of a week. Follow? And uh, in light of that, the believers began to gather on the first day of the week in commemoration of that. The Apostle Paul mentions their gathering on the first day of the week in the book of Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, or 2 Corinthians, for, for, forgive me. And uh, thus it became sort of the, the, the custom among believers. Whenever the believers gathered, that's, that's the day they worship. But the idea of putting a hard and fast rule this particular day of the week had nothing to do with the Gentiles uh, or the church of the New Testament. It has to do with Israel. But, um, and so Christians often forget that all of Christ's ministry was technically in Old Testament times. Those things that Jesus taught that match the Pauline epistles, we accept. We take to be instructions to us directly. Uh, or we glean some sort of uh, encouragement or inspirational benefit from what he said. But uh, those things that do not match what the Apostle Paul instructed uh, probably were intended for the Israel at some different timetable, some time frame, either during Christ's ministry or after the church is gone during the tribulation. Don't forget that tribulation will be um, the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says. And a time such as was not since the beginning of the world, this time no, nor ever shall be, Jesus said in Matthew 24. So, but rightly dividing the word of truth is a, can be a very um, dangerous minefield to navigate through, but it's not impossible. And it just takes someone who says, I'm willing to believe everything, compare scripture with scripture where they match each other, uh, fine. If, they're, if they don't match each other, then maybe one was aimed at you, the other was aimed at someone else. But, um, so we say, now back here in Hebrews chapter uh, 6, I'm just about done for today. Hebrews chapter 6, we say that those in verses 4 through 6, and I'll read those again, 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Um, for them, they are going to be nigh unto cursing, as verse 8 says, whose end is to be burned. Uh, you can't get it back again. So when your Pentecostal friend or charismatic friend says, we believe someone can lose their salvation if they're not careful, they sin, then you have to point, that, point out that according to that text, if that's the case for someone today, they can't get it back again. So it can't be it can't apply to somebody it can't apply to someone today who was never saved to start with, that you know they were hanging around the edges. It can't apply to someone today who loses it. If so, they can't get it back again. It's gonna to have to apply to someone in the future whose salvation is measured by his degree of faith in Christ and his obedience to the commandments, good works, in order to maintain it. How much faith and how much works, I don't know because I don't plan to be here. But that's nevertheless the conclusion you have to come to if you want to make sense of that section of the Bible.